Okay, welcome to our final session of the Secure Our Streets Conference. My name is Scott Shahan. I'll be hosting here for this final session. I'm coming to you from Indiana in the United States. And our presenter here, his name is Reinhard Kuhler, um, and he is coming from Vienna, Austria. And also as a quick tidbit about uh, Reinhard is a windsurfing enthusiast, really enjoys uh, doing the windsurfing. So as you're coming into this last session, it's been about 12 hours of the conference, excellent material, expert speakers, and we're looking forward to this last talk from uh, Reinhard. So now let's welcome him to the stage. Um, he is from SBA Research and the Applied Research Consulting um, from Matrix Group. And he will be presenting on observing the clouds, lessons learned from cloud vulnerabilities for high performance computers or HPCs um, and software containers. In this talk, Reinhard will delve into how software containers could impact the security of software defined vehicles or SDVs. He'll share insights into vulnerabilities exploited in cloud environments and explore advanced defensive techniques applicable to automotive use case use cases. So please welcome me and joining Reinhard uh, Kuhler to the stage. And I will go off as a quick note to the audience. Use the question and answer tab. It's on the right side of the screen. Put your questions there. And while Reinhard is presenting, if you see an interesting question, upvote it. So we ask the most relevant questions at the end. And also, please, because this is a virtual conference, react with the emojis. Give give him some feedback. That's the only feedback Reinhard has while he's while he's talking. So yes, use please. those as much as you can. So I'm going to hide myself. Thank you, Reinhard, and I'll see you at the question and answer. Thank you so much, Scott, and welcome. So if you're like me, I I go outside and. Right now, I don't see any clouds on the horizon, but you always should have a look out because the, the next cloud could be dangerous, right? And we all, we as humans, we, we learned how to differentiate how a cloud looks and how it looks dangerous, right? So for example, if I look at this, uh, at this horizon, uh, then I see that here is some, some fluffy clouds and they're pretty much, pretty much safe, but there are also those on, on the top, which are pretty high, that they're even safer, but maybe the, the ones back here in, in, the, in this area here, maybe if they go up as a tower and go black, then they will be dangerous. And for our real world, this is, of course, quite simple to differentiate. And we all have tools to assess how clouds are or could be dangerous. But in the IT or IoT world, this could, of course, be a main problem. Because if you have a cloud like this, you may be don't know what's running in those and you don't know if they're dangerous if they have vulnerabilities or not and if this could lead in the automotive world as well to a safety hazard so going back a bit and moving into the it world from the uh, like more surface eye i would say that uh, we come a long way and this cl the clouds we now um experience like AWS or Azure or you you name it or Alibaba Cloud, you 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 sure know many more than than I do. They host a lot of services and you don't really care what the or what hardware is used in the in in the back end, right? You just want your services to run safely and securely. And of course this came a long way if you go to to this example here this was the beginnings right we have you have dedicated servers you have dedicated platforms here where you have a, a server for each and every app and of course you need to safeguard those and create networks around those right 
to interconnect them. After some time, the, the servers got more, more junky and more powerful and the shared world began. And this accelerated even more, even more from virtualization to containerization and so on. And now we're having the clouds we all know today. And I'm coming from IT, right? I have an electronics background, but I come from IT and there I saw the pattern repeating in the automotive world again. So I saw that the automotive world also have these cycles where they have the electronic um, architectures, where they have the, the ECUs, the, for example, for brakes or for... Um, for the for the trunk or for for cameras, and they are all interconnected by bus systems like the CAN bus, right? So we we all know that, and we have heard about this several times, and the same cycle repeat uh, repeated. So we are now at the stage from as a very dedicated world to a very central world where we have in the in the middle those. Uh, HPCs, those powerful systems that run our software in a hopefully secure and safe manner. What I also observed is that many of the big players and many of the big players also, uh, or many, um, many employees of the big players are also in this room here they also jumped the wagon and created uh, in-vehicle operating systems for our cars. So we are now seeing the different vendors providing Linux distributions for the, the different platforms and many of them running ARM. So, I, uh, so, so far I worked with customers and I saw that mostly the same the same problems and problem areas arise as we already experienced um, in our work with IT and the cloud. So the question now is, if we're running Linux now in the, in the car, as you have been doing in the cloud, are now containers secure? And with that, I would also ask, okay, maybe you, you didn't have a deep dive into the containers, so let me uh, bring us on the same page here. And the same page, I try to always think of something what I like, and I like burgers a lot. So burgers are the perfect example where you see, okay, you have something um, in, the, in the middle, the meat, and you want to get to the meat. So the meat uh, resembling here our application, and if, if you're taking the meat and just slap it on, the, on your platter, then you... Um, can run software like you meet just on hardware, bare metal, and that's more or less resembling your uh, embedded ECUs, what we're still having today, to this day, for example, like, like those, the, the things where we have the connection points in the front and in there, there's a, a little CPU that's running our, our applications. And of course, um, you can slip an operating system in between and maybe you you already did that, so you could uh, slip, I don't know, a, a Linux, a QNX, whatever, in between and run your applications uh, on top of that. Or you can even create a hypervisor, as we have seen um, in, in one of the great talks about isolation, for example, where you slip in and, and hypervisor as well in between and run several uh, of those systems side by side. Or you can do what the cloud uh, did to, to spare resources and to, to go back on resources. You could slip in just an operating system like Linux and then run the software components as containers, mainly a Linux process. That's all. So that's what's protecting you from, from the outside world. It's just another views on, the, on your file system on your network so that your container is only connected, for example, to those networks you want, that, want it to be connected. 
and nothing else. And of course, you have different file systems, for example, for each and every um, software. So this is only all maintained by um, the Linux kernel and operated by a container runtime, mostly like Docker or C run or run C or Kubernetes. So if you go into the embedded container space, you could create exactly like that. So you can create um, a container running on the Linux kernel and provide it with the interfaces you wanted to have. For example, you want to write maybe on an iSpread C bus, or maybe you want to write on a canvas. And exactly those interfaces are presented in the container. And you can, of course, um, protected with many different uh, different measures. And I'm really curious if you can um, maybe also uh, share your your own way to to like protect the container. But I, in my experience, I saw a lot of uh, like bringing down the security level of or the, the privilege level of one specific software component and running it inside this container as a process. So. If you go back to the cloud and and look at the vulnerabilities, of course, there are many areas where you can find vulnerabilities. You can find it maybe on in the Linux kernel or in the thing that creates the container. So those, for example, those uh, vulnerabilities have been um, used or those schemes, mostly those the schemes are used to break out of a container or you find only the safeguards not sufficient, right? If you try to safeguard the container, you can create um, a separate file system and say, okay, that's, this, this is a special user for that. And you only give it specific uh, capabilities, if you know what I mean. So like the, the possibilities, what, what to do on, on the system. This could also break. And even the orchestrator, right? The thing that or organizes and manages uh, the, the different containers, um, this could also have, have problems. And what we have seen so far is more on uh, in this area uh, with containers on security a little bit here. And since we are not uh, on a level where we run Kubernetes in our cars fully, there are some efforts for that. But we we don't see that, so we're not seeing it right now. But this, I think, will come as well. So, dialing it back into the car space, what are the attacks in cars? And for me, I mean, I try to always to solve something, not always, not only to break it, but to solve it. So, I took out a very old example, but it's it's the like super. Uh, it's a super template to discuss because everyone knows it. And that's the cheap hack, of course. And I won't bore you with details because you all know it. But some details I want to highlight because the attack, as you all know, um, came from the cellular network to the infotainment system. And if you look into this inf infotainment system, the attacker first, or the security researchers first, landed on the Unix platform and then did this flashing of a chip to gain control over the vehicle functions, the canvas, right? So they were able to influence the canvas because they flashed a the chip. So to summarize this for us, for our defense techniques is we want to solve to prevent the attacker to inject can network packets so if they're already here that they are prevented from um, sending can packets into the can network and this, the second thing is to stop the attacker from flashing your chips for for example for secure updates all right how can we do that and how can we do it using the more cutting edge technologies or the more, more juicy technologies from the cloud. So one of the driving factors in the cloud still is the eBPF technology. Maybe you heard about it. If you don't heard of, have heard about it, 
don't mind let's uh let's quickly uh summarize it for us so for us it's important it's like javascript for the kernel so we're talking about running uh, containers on a linux platform and now we want to influence how the kernel protects those processes and Again, eBBF is like JavaScript for the kernel. So you write your code, not in JavaScript, but in C or C-like uh, language. And then you can compile it into a bytecode and ask the kernel to upload it into its memory. And then you can do something very smart. You can uh, attach it to specific points in the, um, in the system. So there are some predefined events where the eBBF program can be triggered, and then you can make decisions based, based on that. So let's dive deeper into that. So you have here a non-comprehensive list of many attachment points. So you can write a program, and then you, can, you, you take this program, load it in the kernel, and this attachment point triggers then the program. So for example, if you receive a specific network packet, then your program gets executed. If you run a specific syscall, so so to say, if you if you read a file that's that's doing something in the in the kernel, and then your eppf program can be triggered, or you trace something for debugging, for example, and then your program can be triggered. So there are many many ways to to do that. And let's dive into how the, the big girls and guys are doing this. Usually they create, for example, the, um, a program that governs the network of, of the cloud. Because in the cloud, is, it must be all software defined because it needs to be so flexible and, and fast. And I think we can learn from that to use this also in the car space because they have been very successful at observing traffic and events on the system using eppf and i think this could be expanded to the to the car space especially for example in the in the can space because there the problem is if you like create a new can domain this could result in creating more and more wires and more and more weight into the into the car and of course uh, customers uh, that don't want that i i'm not a a car builder, so I'm just a security researcher and, and, and tester, but I can report that it could be quite an interesting thing. So if you take the, the CAN frames, if you're, you're all familiar with that, of course, we can say, okay, for specific IDs and data portions, we want to assess every time a CAN packet leaves the container or gets into the container. So, Let's go one step further. How can we attach it? If we have the CAN network, of course, how can we use it in, in the kernel? And there's this great work from Oliver Hartkopf and the other contributors who created the infrastructure to attach it. Like they, they have now the ability, or we have in Linux, the abilities to use CAN into, um, in containers. And we can, of course, uh, attach the DBPF programs to that. So what we can do is we write a program like this. We say, for example, in this program, um, for a specific ID um, number, I don't know, hex one, two, three, then I would like to drop it because this is not a valid ID for this container. Or I can, could say for this ID, I would like to check a specific value, or it will check the CRC or something, right? Or a signature. I don't know. That the imagination is 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 quite endless, and you sure have uh, interesting um, interesting use cases for that. But going further, we can attach this program then to a hook, and it's called the XTP hook. It's it's just part of the of the Linux networking, and doing that we now then ending up in a situation like this. So we have can traffic um, in the container and we are now loading this program into the kernel and say, hey, 
I would like to um, change the operation mode for a specific um, for a specific ID. So that's just a toy program I I, I wrote just to illustrate here um, the 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 possibilities. Of course, this is not production ready, uh, but the things I can share here we can see that the length, for example, is limited, or we can check for a specific value that or a value range. And only those packages packages are accepted to the in the kernel and uh, the other uh, packets are just discarded. So they don't reach the container, which is cool because now we can wrap around another layer for this program. And we see here in this example here that the kernel still is processing all the packets but they don't reach the user space. So this is could be a, a good potential um, for additional security measures. And if you'd ask me, I'm sure you, you have um, more experience in, in the architecture, uh, in the architectures, but in my view, this could simplify maybe some architecture or can contribute to security in complex architectures where you have situations where you uh, put have to put this ECU in a domain and you want to like um, block traffic for a specific container. So you could say maybe for this container or for this uh, Linux process, you put in this program to filter or to create another check because it's, an, it's from a third party maybe and you need to um, have more safeguards around this or the vulnerabilities is known. So that's, that's around can as a inspiration and I'm happy, I have, I will be happy to follow up, but I would like to also show you another example on the flashing of, of chips or using a specific bus, which is the SBI bus, because it was also um, uh, quite uh, strongly used in the um, in the GPAC if you read the paper and I, I linked it uh, down here. So what uh, the second part was this flashing of this V850 chip via SPI lines, right? So the the Unix system here didn't have access to the canvas here. So they need to flash the other chip. And the chip was exposed via the SPI bus, this uh, onboard bus, to the Unix platform. And as you maybe all know, uh, the SPI bus is quite simple. So it's just several wires uh, you run to the different chips. And for example, if you want to flash something, this could be a sock, or this could be external flash, or maybe also another another sensor is on on this uh, on this particular bus and in linux this is represented as those spi dev uh, as sti dev programs right uh, sorry device nodes so how to protect it of course you can use the the common protections like you um, you limit the process you, using specific capabilities and of course, in our work or in my work, I, I, I deal a lot with containers and and container privileges. So you can limit, of course, the different um, capabilities, permissions, user IDs, blah, 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 or, yeah, to l restrict the process. But of course, you can also um, add, for example, App Armor policies or SLinux Linux policies, like to create another layer, or you can create in our case here, and I want to talk today just on eBPF, a way to limit the access to the SPI bus again with a program. So for Linux, again, we have the process writing through this device node, through the driver, through this uh, digital IO, which modulates the SPI bus to the specific uh, flash. And here maybe there is a sock uh, that can be flashed. And in the Linux, there's a tracing, uh, there's a tracing infrastructure you can use and you can 
exactly read the different addresses where the SPI bus has the current payloads where it's writing to, right? Or what it's writing and what bus is used. So this is all provided by tracing and you can take this um, again with the EPPF program. So here I had, had the logic analyzer hooked up on a, on the SPI bus. So you have the different data wires uh, here um, on the on the right and on the left. I create quickly a little SP, uh, an EBPF program to limit the access to this bus. So the use case would be, okay, you, you check a signature during an update or you check uh, the header of an update if something is, is, is weird. And of course you can then block it. So the, the program plo blocks the access to the SPI bus only as long it's running. And that's really powerful because you can do it on the fly without touching the container or the application itself. So this is just a, like a, a wrapper around uh, your, um, your container. So that's all cool, but what about offensive capabilities? And I would like to use the, the remaining minutes uh, to also talk about this. Of course, you can use EPPF not only for good, you can also use it for offensive capabilities. And I think it's very important to know about this because there are already um, uh, publications from last year and the year before that, uh, that showed that already EPPF is abused for it attacking. And that's really, really problematic because you could create something like this. I showcasing here just a root kit an attacker could ins install. And here I hooked up my, my own car. And on the right, you will be seeing the traffic flowing in while I'm, I'm using my car in the driveway. And I also uh, decoded the traffic. So it's here uh, showing the RPM on the instrument cluster reading from the canvas. And if I load the eBPF program, then this data can be changed. And on the fly, it rewrites the CAN packets. And now you were seeing that the CAN packets are representing suddenly that my RPM my um, my RPM of the engine is just 9,000. And if you unload it again, it's it's gone. So this could be very dangerous as well. So it's very important to know the basics of EPPF because it could also be attack an attack in the future. Good, wrapping things up here. So there are already some, some vectors and attacks and I put it in the slides for your reference. But uh, wrapping things up here, are the, the next clouds or is the cloud in your car a problem and are HPCs exposed? And in my opinion, the architectural changes uh, are already addressing a lot of the security problems as well in, in, automotive, in the automotive domain, but they could be armed or improved with state-of-the-art technologies and EBPF could be a good way to um, contribute to that because it's a software-defined protection. So you can, after you release a, a car, you can load an EBPF program at runtime and change the behavior and try to like restrict a container even more this could also be a process uh, running on, on the ECU. And it's quite flexible because you can like unload and unload it and the kernel doesn't crash, which is always a problem with like kernel modules. I'm coming also from a like a defense world. So there the attacks always are mutating and changing. So I would say that's also contributing to the fact that you can be on like on the edge or on the on the forefront of security because you can alter your defenses with 
without changing the application and the containers um, themselves. So with that, I thank you for your attention. If you want to work with us, I'm happy to discuss. We're uh, doing research and consulting um, as well as trainings. So if you're interested, please uh, reach out to me. We're also doing meetups. If you're interested, I will post the links afterwards in the chat. And with that, I'm closing here and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Okay, can you hear me, Reinhard? Yes. Uh, my camera is malfunctioning right now. Um, I That's want fine. to just say thank you. Um, we'll go into the question and answer period. Um, and for those in the audience that are here, please continue to add questions. We have about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, if we don't go the whole time, that's fine as well, because we'll be closing up after this with the SOS um, conference, and John will be giving you the closing remarks. Um, so let's go to our first. I'll put the first question up here. With the ongoing architectural shift, and we had yeah different um, technologies talked about today in this container-based uh, approach that you're presenting, and then also some hypervisor type um, talks that we've seen. Um, do you think that the security is getting better or worse? How do you see it on the long run? And this is from Sebastian out of Germany. Yeah, Sebastian, uh, thank you for the question. And that's a very good one because in my opinion, the like the box of Pandora has been opened so I, I think, um, I don't know, five years ago or seven years ago, or at least my my car has only limited software defined functions, right? And right now, the complexity drastically increases. Of course, if you want to have the those features, right? The features of self-driving, maybe voice recognition, like your uh, using a, a kit uh, vehicle from Knight Rider, right? Then you will be ending up in a situation where you need the technology stack. And to refer to your question, I think, um, yes, this security area is getting maybe worse in a way because the complexity is so high. But more and more people are like exchanging in, in the domains, like me, for example, I'm coming from a uh, security and a bit of engineering domain and now I'm moving more into safety and, and learning about, okay, how, how does safety work and, and so on. And I find it wonderful that this shift, this architectural shift as well is happening because to close this, um, I think it's the only way to sustain at functionality stack like this, as we have seen in the cloud. Now the cloud is quite complex, but also quite secure. It's not that easy to, to sneak your attacks in anymore. So it's matured. And I think in the automotive to domain, this shift also is maturing right now, but it needs some time, I think. And I think uh, you, as you're saying, yeah, it does need some time. I know a lot of these talks I'm interested on how this, everybody here I think is also interested on this architectural shift going towards this more zonal architecture. And if we think about in anything, security and functionality are opposed in some sense. Yeah. The functionality of if you can maybe develop, you have benefits to development, uh, maybe I mean, as you're talking with the containers, you could have different um, strategies for bringing up containers and having different. Uh, maybe there's like a tier three container supplier. I'm just, I'm just saying maybe the development processes are are increased, or maybe also on the hypervisor level, you can again somebody's done the analysis that the <laughs> that the cost hopefully is less for the uh, OEM and the compute resources go up. So it's, we're always balancing security with the, uh, the functionality that these new architectures bring. So thank you for the question, uh, Sebastian. We'll go, we have another one come up here. Um, 
let's go with this one from Maurice. Um, may have already been answered previously, but missed some part, unfortunately. Okay, that's okay. Um, you talked about containerized apps and the kernel isolation. Um, is that really the case? In the server world, the kernel is being shared by default and things like Gvisor or Kata um, are needed. That's a that's a wonderful question to to expand on that. Think again, like a burger. Of course, uh, if if you if you have a very low profile or version of the virtualization, which we have in, for example, containers as we as we know them with Docker or Kubernetes and so on, then we have a very slim um, layer of protection. Because this layer of protection is just what the kernel, as you correctly state, um, is protecting or isolating, right? We have to trust the kernel. If the kernel is compromised, then it's gone. And that's also a, a main problem here. And as you're re uh, correctly pointing out, you will be needing more ways to like isolate things or to make things more complex, like virtualization in terms of your you virtualize a part of the um, of the hardware as well, but then you will be ending up using more resources. And my um, um, my my observation, let's let's say, is that in the automotive and OT space as well, resources are very limited, especially uh, if you if you look at HPCs. Sure, the the ARM platforms are quite powerful. But if you like now ch chunk it up with many many software uh, components in parallel, the, this will be used up quickly. So I think the the slimmest solution will win, as in the cloud. So now in the cloud, not the VMs uh, took over; it it is the containers, which is the lightweight version. Mm -hmm. And I think that that segues well into this next question. Um, I'm going to go to this. Sebastian had another question come up about this changing architecture in the IT domain. Right now, there's some counter movement back from all cloud to dedicated servers for four specific use cases. So went to the cloud, and now we're migrating back. Do you think this will happen in automotive, like with these diff this architecture, the different architectures that we're seeing? Do you think? Um, I mean, what's your what's your opinion on this? I think it it already happened. So the uh, I think what's what happened in the cloud is that if you put everything in the cloud and the cloud goes dark, then you have nothing, right? And there was the I I, I think ten years ago there were the, those not so hilarious uh, outages where people lost their companies overnight because the the cloud providers gone bankrupt bankrupt and then all the resources are gone because they are decommissioning everything, right? I think that this is the lessons learned from for the automotive. For example, so far I didn't see a brake controller or an engine controller in as a safety critical component or a airbag controller as a mm -hmm. safety critical component not dedicated on one ECU and I don't know uh, encapsulated in metal and protected from everything. So I think it's it will be the same. It will be hybrid. So many, uh, many parts that are safety critical, I think there is at least not the, the easy way to, uh, to virtualize it. Mm -hmm. Sure, there, there, are, um, there are experts here that, that have an opinion, but I think the, the safety critical parts will be like on premise, <laughs> uh, like uh, dedicated and more the the things that can um, can break for five minutes, so non safety critical parts that will be containerized and virtualized, in my opinion. But I'm just from yeah. coming from security. It will it will be interesting to see how this plays out. And I think, yeah, all these, the architecture shifts, we, we see the pros and cons and, and engineers, we're always trying to figure out how to make things better. So let me bring up another question um, we have here. Again, um, this one is from 
Rafal, um, from Poland. Do you think this architectural shift towards the software-defined vehicle, centralized compute, containers, et cetera, will also make it easier, easier the introduction of crypto agility approaches and introduction of uh, post-quantum crypto readiness? Will the automotive cybersecurity uh, benefit from that at that end with this architecture? What's What are your thoughts here? Yeah, awesome, Rafael, because I think I think exactly that this could contribute. Why? Because more and more people are, are now coming into this space, into this automotive space, and especially the like the cycles, how fast software evolves in the automotive domain was slow, but it's now right now in my observation, um, also with, with customers moving a lot into this uh, continuous uh, deployment world, right? Where you push out updates as, as well, or e at least try to have faster cycles and not being stuck with one, one cryptography library forever. And I think this will, or this, this way of, of also developing software, um, I think will be a cornerstone to be secure in, in the future. I think this will also be right now a, a quite a heavy lifting to like transform the different companies into more software oriented companies and uh, try to avoid the, 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 the like pitfalls of the IT world as well. Yeah, and I think on the uh, post-quantum crypto, very interesting area. Also the dedicated, I know in ECUs now work with dedicated hardware accelerators for a lot of crypto, especially if it's runtime, uh, you need to have the runtime performance to do your, your crypto processing um, on the hardware accelerators. It'll be interesting to see Again, if there's a solution, if you if you increase the compute, you have like these server grade com compute resources. If you can do software, uh, maybe a P PQC, um, that'll be interesting. Okay, mm -hmm. let me see. Um, I have a one. We'll take one or two more questions depending on the time. We have about three minutes left. Let's bring this one up here. Um, this is from Nick Hill. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. From India. Um, might be slightly off topic. The Jeep hack could have been prevented if the Renaissance uh, V850 chip had the secure software update flashing functionality. Is that right? Because I believe what the researchers did was a malicious uh, firmware over there on the V850. So can you address that question or that yeah. I guess, comment and question? Uh, I agree. So the uh, I think one of the, the problems, as I, I read the paper and uh, listened to the talks, that my impression was that the um, VF50 was, as you, uh, uh, as Nikhil uh, pointed out correctly, flashed with a malicious firmware directly um, from the Unix platform. And I think um, if the chip itself could be in a way that it verifies the, the contents, um, then this could be prevented. That's also a feedback I got from one of my previous talks that there is usually another functionality that, that checks for that. And I would also would like to point out here that um, EBPF is would be just another layer for that. So the the things we we saw is just another layer, but deep deep down there should be another component that checks for firmware verification as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, uh, Reinhard, for all of the Q&A. And thank you to the audience as well. Please give Reinhard uh, some emoji reactions in our virtual conference. This is wrapping up Secure Our Streets. Uh, so if you'd like to get in touch with Reinhard, he has his uh, information here on the screen. And we will now go over to the closing remarks from John Heldreth. Let's jump over to stage one. And thank you, Reinhard, for your interesting discussion. I, I enjoyed it today. Thank you so much, and thanks for hosting. Yeah, not a problem. All right. Take care, guys. See you over there. See you over there.